This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Two global powers are locked in conflict. It was essentially a struggle for world supremacy between Britain and France. At the center of it all, the American colonies. On a big scale, uh, this is our link to the first true world war. And it is actually the site of at least one battle. Today, depressions and mounds in the earth reveal North Carolina's connection to the French and Indian War, the site of Fort Dobbs. In the next half hour, we'll explore the story of Fort Dobbs, its past and present, and learn more about recent archaeological work at the site. And today, we're, we've already discovered new uh, parts of the Fort Dobbs story here. Musket ball. <laughs> That's all coming up on A Trail of History. The following episode of Trail of History is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. Bragg Financial Advisors, a family-owned wealth management firm providing investment management and tax and estate planning for families, individuals, and institutions for more than 50 years, committed to our clients, to education, and our community. Hello, I'm Tony Zeiss, president of Central Piedmont Community College. You know, the rich and diverse history of the Charlotte region is just wonderful, and we at the college want to bring it to you and share it. We understand the importance of history. We understand the importance of learning from the past so that we can do better in the future. I want to tell you that you're in for a real treat. The History Department at Central Piedmont Community College has partnered with our television station to bring you this special one-of-a-kind history program. Stay tuned. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Hello and welcome to Trail of History. I'm Gary Ritter. About two decades before the American Revolution, competition between England and France over control of lands in North America led to the French and Indian War. In this section of what's now Iredell County, just north of Statesville, was the frontier, and Fort Dobbs was built to garrison soldiers and provide a refuge for settlers. Two sides, obscured by smoke and thick brush, find themselves locked in a recreated firefight of a battle that took place near present-day Statesville, North Carolina, more than 250 years ago. The skirmish pitted North Carolina provincials against the native Cherokee. So we're talking about the Cherokee War, which is about 1759 to 1761. And for visitors to Fort Dobbs State Historic Site's War for Empire event, the fight unfolding before them gives a new perspective on the past. I appreciate coming here. I appreciate what people did, but I don't envy any of it. Site manager Scott Douglas. So events like the one going on this weekend are a good chance for us to bring a lot of the public out uh, and learn about this piece of North Carolina history. But events of this scale take a lot of effort and a passion for that history. Johnson. Names ring out for an early morning roll call. Kennedy. Here, Sergeant. On the very grounds where the frontier fort once stood. The Castro. Yes, sir. It's followed up with a briefing. At 9.30. All to get the troops ready for the site's annual War for Empire event. It's the largest of several living history programs we put on during the course of the year. The annual spring event with a two-day encampment requires more than 60 volunteers and staff to pull off. Boys, your pilot. Dressed in heavy wool coats and 18th century attire, this platoon of reenactors portrays the colonial provincial soldiers who once called Fort Dobbs home. Air Force veteran Tom Nicastro got involved in living history about seven years ago. Well, I'm a fairly newcomer to this. During the week, he's an aircraft mechanic for American Airlines. Yes, uh, that's it. Most, most times I'm working on uh, very, very technical aircraft and that, uh, doing any number of jobs. Uh, and the next weekend, I'm out here uh, you know, trying to participate in something that's much, much, much less technical. But for Nicastro, retirement's just on the horizon. This is nice because now I have something to do where most guys probably go out and they play golf. I have this and a bunch of good friends to share it with. This hobby takes up 
quite a lot of your time. And money. Several thousands of dollars. It's not a cheap sport. Everything has to be correct. Our guns, for instance. This gun here is a copy of a Dutch Type II weapon. Comes into existence about 1730. There's only one source in the United States to get this. Fellow reenactor, Jim Strong. I'm portraying a North Carolina provincial soldier. We're full-time soldiers. We generally sign up for a year at a time. We are raised, fed, clothed, supposedly, by the colony of North Carolina. We are not British regulars. This coat is called blue with red facings. It was standard throughout the British colonies for provincial soldiers. It's wool. Uh, it's meant to last long, even though in the summertime it's terribly hot. The, the rest of my clothes are common clothes, what I would have had as a private individual. If you're interested in getting started in the hobby, Strong and Castro have some advice. Well, one of the prep works that you do is when you buy a car, you take a tape measure to make sure your tent poles will go in it. You can borrow quite a bit of the equipment that's needed if you show an interest where you think you're going to stay on, then they usually give you about two years to fully kit yourself out. And volunteers are the lifeblood of a site like Fort Dobbs. The reenactors here come from all over, from several states away. We have people here from Pennsylvania, uh, from Tennessee, from South Carolina this weekend. And it's important to them to be able to share uh, this piece of history with our visitors. With so many volunteers making their way to Fort Dobbs, there's much to see and learn when you attend the event. Well, up here at Fort Dobbs, I'm portraying a war captain from the Cherokee Lower Towns, the Lower Towns down in what's now Northwest South Carolina. And a war captain was usually one of the more notable warriors from a town who would have called for volunteers from his village and then led them off on the war path. During the week, Will Caldwell looks a little different. By day, I am a National Park Ranger with the Southern Campaign of the American Revolution Parks Group. So I'm talking 1780s on my day job, playing 1760s on the weekend. And on this weekend, he's answering questions at the recreated Cherokee Village. Uh, one of the biggest questions is, are we the good guys or bad guys? Um, and when you're talking about the French and Indian War and the Cherokee War, 59 to 61, the answer is both. So I'm tying up the lamb. What we're doing out here today is we have an 18th century camp kitchen set up. Terry Ramsbotham's passion for history and cooking mixed together perfectly here at Fort Dobbs. As we're showing people the types of food people would eat in the 18th century, the ways that they were cooked. You can smell them, you can see them, and you can experience it that way. And what we're doing right now is we're cooking dinner, which would be like the noonday meal. As the saying goes, an army marches on its stomach. So Ramsbotham and others at the kitchen tent aren't just demonstrating 18th century cooking and cuisine, they're also taking on the important task of feeding the volunteers. We're having two large hands because we're feeding 60 people. And we're having lamb. We're having lamb with a mint sauce. The mint sauce is made with mint, uh, red wine vinegar, and sugar. And it's going to be served with sliced oranges. Walk away from the kitchen tent, and you might meet a musician, a cobbler, a spinner, a blacksmith. Or you might run into Lyman Clark. We do lithic reproductions of uh, artifacts. Uh, this is called napping. It's not like where you go to bed and sleep. This is a reduction of rocks, uh, and you reduce them to uh, tools. Uh, this has been carried on for thousands and thousands of years. They're making tools such as arrowheads and knives out of rock. Before you could go to a hardware store and buy your tools, uh, you had to make them. It's an aggravating endeavor because you break a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, when you reproduce something that they made thousands of years ago, you're proud of what you've done. The French and Indian War took place from 1754 to 1763. 
And although it involved many nations around the world, it was essentially a struggle for world supremacy between Britain and France. It's also known as the Seven Years' War and the Great War for Empire. In uh, North America, it focused on the area disputed between the British colonies on the eastern seaboard and the expanding French colony, New France, which was expanding south from Canada through the back country west of the Appalachian Mountains to Louisiana. The French had their Native American allies and the British had their Native American allies, such as the powerful Iroquois Confederacy. And the area of dispute focused on an area called the Ohio Country, which was the upper reaches of the Ohio River Valley. And there were confrontations, disputes over land, and open hostilities broke out after 1754. The area surrounding Fort Dobbs today looks far different than it did during colonial times. Where Statesville stands today uh, was the western frontier of this British colony. The scattered settlers living in this countryside were in danger of being attacked by Indians allied with the French. Fort Dobbs is actually named for the royal governor of North Carolina, Arthur Dobbs. Governor Dobbs entered office in 1754. He had become governor just prior to this war's beginning, and he was a good man to have in charge. He was uh, ardently on the side of England, building an empire of crushing the French. Uh, he really didn't like them very much. Uh, he wanted to see North Carolina expand. While much of the French and Indian War focused on the Ohio River Valley, Governor Dobbs did not stand idly by. And he became concerned that the French and Indian War, the problems of the middle, the middle uh, colonies, would spread down to North Carolina. And he petitioned the Colonial Assembly for troops and for, for funds to, to protect the colony. Fort Dobbs uh, was constructed in 1755 to 56 uh, by North Carolina provincial soldiers. These were uh, full-time troops serving this royal colony uh, in the period of the French and Indian War. The fort itself was a three-story high block house with about 8,000 square feet. There's some historical speculation as to if Governor Dobbs had a vested interest in the fort's construction. Coincidentally, he owned large tracts of land near the fort. To have a, uh, the settlers feel safe, to have a military garrison out here to ward off enemy attacks obviously benefited uh, his interests as well. Fort Dobbs did see some action during the French and Indian War. There was an attack on the fort by about 60 or 70 Cherokee warriors uh, in 1760. The fact that it's the Cherokee who, who attack Fort Dobbs is one of the ironies of our history. Uh, when the French and Indian War begins, the Cherokee are officially allies of Great Britain and her colonies. But as more and more settlers moved into the region, tension escalated between the British and the local Cherokee people. As they're serving England, uh, the Cherokee feel pressure from English settlement encroaching onto their lands. Uh, the settlers that are living in this area are part of a migration of thousands of people moving from Pennsylvania, where land is getting very expensive, down what was called the Great Wagon Road uh, through the Shenandoah Valley and here into Western Carolina. Uh, and these people have only one direction to go farther, and that is west, directly onto the land of the Cherokee. So even as they're fighting their common enemy, the Cherokee are having their land taken by their supposed allies. Uh, a, a tension understandably builds out of this and a mistrust between the two sides, and eventually that spills over into open warfare as uh, dozens of Cherokee are killed by English settlers. Their relatives take blood vengeance as their culture at the time demanded for murder, and we have uh, settlers killed, not necessarily the guilty people in either party. And it becomes a cycle of retribution and revenge uh, that becomes a war within the bigger French and Indian War. Uh, the Anglo-Cherokee War, as it's called, lasts from 1759 to 61, as the colonies here in the south are fighting their former friends. That war within a war came to Fort Dobbs on the night of February 27, 1760. The, the battle here at Fort Dobbs was a little unique as far as uh, battles at the time go in that it happened at nighttime. 
it was very uncommon for night attacks to take place in this period because there's no, you don't have flashlights or night vision, you don't have radio command and control, of course. Uh, and so it can be very confusing very quickly to be in combat at night. You know, to think about uh, what went through the minds of those soldiers as their pitch blackness is suddenly transformed into a sheet of fire in front of them it must have been terrifying. They suspect uh, by their dogs barking at something that the Cherokee were approaching. So these men leave the fort, they march about 300 yards from the building into the frigid February darkness, and out of nowhere they come under gunfire from dozens of Cherokee warriors. As many as 60 were recorded to be here. The nighttime raid on Fort Dobbs was the only action the outpost would see. The French and Indian War ended in 1763, a war that unknowingly set the colonies on a path to revolution. It was the results of the French and Indian War and the global conflict that it was part of that created the American Revolution just a decade after this war ended. England was hugely in debt from conquering a worldwide empire, from kicking the French out of North America, and to recoup some of that cost, uh, they imposed taxes on the colonies. After the war, the fort was abandoned. Uh, the frontier had moved west uh, pretty, a pretty far distance. Uh, they no longer needed to spend money to keep it up, and so the government let it go. Uh, the building, we know, quickly deteriorated. Uh, local settlers eventually wanted to clear the site for farmland as it rotted and disintegrated, and uh, by the early 1800s, uh, it was just a farmer's field. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Daughters of the American Revolution purchased the site. In the 1960s, the group partnered with the state of North Carolina to conduct an archaeological study on the land. The research revealed the fort's location and put the wheels in motion to publicly protect the site. The state uh, acquired the property in 1973 and it actually opened to the public in 1976 as a historic site. The state of North Carolina has conducted extensive archaeological work here and uh, we've unearthed thousands of artifacts and we've been able to restore not the wooden building, although we're working towards that, but some of the uh, earthen features that the soldiers themselves dug, a ditch that surrounded the building, a well that was inside, and uh, people can actually see that physical spot where the fort was. Jump forward to the summer of 2016 and a new army has descended on Fort Dobbs an army of volunteers armed with high-tech tools. Today we're having a uh, archeological survey on the property. Archaeology informs quite a bit of what we know of the history of Fort Dobbs. Uh, it fills in the blanks where the written record doesn't give us answers. Uh, we find things to support what we do know from the documentation, and we uh, sometimes find new evidence that uh, uh, fills out the story of the soldiers who were living here in the 1760s. A small team gets to work in a nearby field, while a larger team works right up to the edge of the fort's original location. The purpose of today's uh, survey is to look at some areas that have never been explored archaeologically, uh, to uh, clear some sensitive sites prior to the reconstruction of Fort Dobbs, uh, and to uh, find areas that we can go in in a future date and uh, explore more fully uh, with a full-scale archaeological excavation. There's a lot of different ways to approach archaeology, a lot of different methods and tools that can be employed. Uh, a lot of the major excavations here in the 1960s and 70s involved full-scale excavations of hundreds of square meters of the site. But on this day, we're using some methods that allow us to cover a wider area uh, to get an idea of what's there for future uh, exploratory work. So the ground penetrating radar and magnetometer allow us to see below the surface of the ground before we ever put a shovel into the soil. Deputy State Archaeologist John Mintz. Is everyone here at that particular time had a voice, a loud voice, a voice that everybody could understand. And I try to give that voice back now because their material culture is here. The items they carry daily, the things they use in daily life, things they may have inadvertently discarded, intentionally discarded, but their voice remains on this ground. And I like to be able to give that voice back. Mintz organized the survey and laid out the objectives. What do we know about the site? What do we think we know about the site? What would we like to know about the site? So we'll actually write those questions down and put them in a larger research format. And then we'll look at ways to address those questions. 
we always are talking and looking for ways so we can combine together to more or less approach a project from a lot of different angles. Volunteers and students take an important role in the day's activities. What we like to do is bring volunteers into it and students and show them how archaeology works, share our expertise and our education with them, and try and continue to ignite the fire or the interest that they have in archaeology and anthropology so that they can take that and become ambassadors as well. Volunteers allow us to cover more of the state in a more systematic manner than we could possibly hope to do ourselves. And Mintz had no trouble mustering the troops. Archaeologists, especially in the Southeast, are a very tight-knit group. That tight-knit group includes volunteers from the Old North State Metal Detectorist Club and folks like Sarah Lowry. I'm an archaeologist and geophysics specialist. She works for New South Associates, a company that specializes in identifying, researching, and excavating archaeological sites. Today, along with her co-worker, Sean Patch, they'll get their steps in. Sean is doing ground penetrating radar, which is a geophysical technique that sends electromagnetic energy into the ground, and it reflects off of changes below the ground, and then we record it. We're collecting gigabytes of data every time we're out in the field. And from all that data, they get images like this. And we'll look for patterns in that data to see if those reflections that we measured line up with each other. Maybe they form some patterns. If we're lucky, some sort of rectangular patterns like a building or a foundation. Lowry went to work with a different instrument. I was using a magnetic gradiometer. Sometimes people call it a magnetometer. What that is doing is measuring the change in magnetism at the ground. So what we're looking for there is um, either high or low magnetic readings. And once again, with that, we collect a bunch of lines and we line those up and we look for patterns in those high and low magnetic readings. There are high-tech methods with potentially big payoffs. Well, one way to use um, geophysics for archaeology is to target excavations, because excavations are kind of inherently destructive. If we were doing that traditionally with what we would call shovel test excavation, it would take five to seven times, maybe 10 times as long to do it. But this way, we can cover a lot of ground, get some immediate data, take and winnow that data down, and then direct our efforts to a specific area instead of a more larger or random area. So we don't have to dig up a whole site to just find what we're looking for. Meanwhile, in another area of the Fort Dobbs site, the team from the Old North State Detectorist Club search systematically back and forth over a defined area. The grid process allows us to take something that's one-dimensional when you look at the ground and lay a three-dimensional grid over it so that when we recover those artifacts, we can place them back in the proper space and time. A piece of iron. The metal detectors allow us to, especially in the case of looking at a battlefield, uh, find patterns in where bullets are fired or dropped. It's possibly a piece of a musket ball. Uh, they allow us to find the metal artifacts that may have pottery or animal bones or other artifacts associated with them. Club member and volunteer Mac McAtee has got a few years under his belt. I've been metal detecting since about 1974. I'm fascinated with history. The best part of my day today, you mean? Uh, the first thing I came across, the first signal I got and dug up was a bullet. It was apparently dropped or fired from the fort that was here. And since then, we found a goodly number of musket balls. Uh, musket ball. <laughs> Possibly from the battle at Fort Dobbs in February 1760. It's an amazing thing that you're holding something in your hand that's what now, 250 years old? That the last time a person, held, a person held it in their hand to load their weapon and 250 years later, you're finding it. And it's, it's an astounding thing. Because without these machines, this stuff would never, nobody would ever know it's here. Today's goals was, believe it or not, to see if we could find any artifacts that dated to the period of occupation in the mid 1700s. Second research question was, could we recover any artifacts dating to the skirmish that took place at this site? And we have found both so far. I think this kind of archaeology is really exciting. And it's always really fun to get the public involved, because these are, these are public lands. And um, I think involving the people who, who essentially, you know, this belongs to all of us in North Carolina. So getting involved and learning about these public lands is, is really exciting. And, and the more you know about Fort Dobbs, the better they can interpret it for the public and for all of us. 
the staff and volunteers at Fort Dobbs State Historic Site Fire! take their role as caretakers to heart. It's a very rewarding job and to uh, have a, a light bulb moment, as we call it, to see people understand uh, the relevance of this place and uh, its uh, place in the history of the nation and the history of the world uh, is very rewarding. Not to mention rewarding for the visitors who come to events like War for Empire. The French and Indian War is not a big war. Um, that's not one we learn about so much. But I think the kids, everybody coming here, they come and see this. They're going to remember that. They're going to remember North Carolina's part in it. Based on written and archaeological records, Fort Dobbs State Historic Site plans to reconstruct the fort in the future, giving visitors a new way to experience North Carolina's colonial roots. Thank you for watching Trail of History right here on PBS Charlotte. production of PBS Charlotte.